hope that's staying in that episode. <laughs> Welcome to the Awesome Popcorn Chicken Podcast. I'm here with noted popcorn chicken lover, Hannah Brannon. That's How are you? right. Uh, you gotta follow the chicken. That's what I gotta say. <laughs> uh-huh. Here we are. Pause it for me. Episode 58. Two episodes away from our intended series finale. Not saying we're never going to come back to it, but... At least our indefinite hiatus. Yeah. But in my mind, it's like no current plans. Yeah, like Dave the Barbarian. If you look on the Wikipedia page, it just says says it's it's on on hiatus. hiatus. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. (laughs) And uh, as of episode 58, I think we are about to produce possibly our worst episode. Why? Or at least... The most embarrassing episode to me. Okay. For for me. So we watched All the President's Men, which is a movie from 1976, directed by Alan J. Pacula. Rated G. Very (laughs) Pacula. Rated G, which is odd. That seems low. Isn't that like post dated? Though, because they didn't actually institute, like, the difference between, like... Well, in the trivia, it said it was going to be rated R, but they brought it down to PG, and now it says G. Anyway, getting off track. Okay. So we watched All the President's Men. This movie is the hardest I've ever worked, I think, at least in recent memory. The hardest I've ever worked to stay focused and follow the plot and follow everything that was going on. It is tough. I tried very hard to stay following each moment that happened in the point A to point B. And all that to say, going into this movie, I didn't know anything about it. But as soon as it started, I was like, oh, this is about Watergate. This is the Watergate movie. Great. Yes. I'm excited because I don't know anything about Watergate. I know it has to do with Richard Nixon. That's all I knew. Yep. And coming out of this movie, I feel like I know... Almost as much about Watergate as I did before starting it. Look. I'm sorry. I tried so hard. But if you were to ask me, Mm -hmm. ask me right now, what was the Watergate scandal about? What was the Watergate scandal about? So the committee to reelect Richard Nixon Mm -hmm. did did something where they broke in. And they did okay. something and then they got caught and then Richard Nixon was like, okay, I'm stepping down. That's about as much as I know after watching all the presidents. Yeah. Men. I tried so hard to it, follow everything. I, I'm i sorry, but this is the best I could do. Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing with real life detective work and stuff. It's noticing the differences between two different arduous details. Like, it's not as glamorous <laughs> It actually could be, which is why a lot of people hadn't uncovered it because, you know, they didn't want to look into it because it's just a lot of like comparing facts and details and and stuff. (laughs) Okay, so let's break it down. So all the president's men. Here's the log line. The Washington Post reporters Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein uncover the details of the Watergate scandal that led to President Richard Nixon's resignation. So as soon as it started, I started writing things down. Mm-hmm. Okay, I wrote down, you know, National Democratic Headquarters, Committee to Reelect the President, Woodward and Bernstein. Like I was taking note of their names. I was I was trying to follow everything. Mm-hmm. And this sometimes movies based on real events turn out to be like a stuff happens kind of movie. This is an example of a, a stuff happens kind of movie that I think is like pretty good for being a stuff happens. Especially kind of movie. because of all the details like and they tried to be as accurate as possible i think right um i wouldn't say this movie is boring in fact i would no. say it was surprisingly exciting considering the subject matter i think the cinematographers had to work like triple time to make it as compelling as it is because like the actual journalism work is incredible that they were able to uncover something like this but the the ins and outs of the details are you know whatever like him talking to deep throat in the parking garage i'm sure those conversations weren't quite that cinematic in real life and then they did a great job of creating that sort of trope where it's like no one make sure no one followed you come alone kind of thing 
follow the money. Like, that's kind of a... And just the idea of, like, things being called, like... If it's a scandal, it's a something gate. Even though, like, Watergate has nothing to do with an actual y- gate. Yeah. But, yeah, you're, what yeah. you're saying is, like, all that came from this, basically. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, you never know because we touched on this in our Great Escape episode is like this movie was made only a few years after that yes, happened. very fresh. And so the men involved were there. So they were able to provide the details of mm-hmm. everything that was factually correct. Very quickly afterwards because uh, the inauguration was in 73. The book came out because the movie takes place like right – like the end of the movie is near the – inauguration the book came out in 74 robert redford purchased it in 74 and the movie came out in 76 Hmm. i read that robert redford was even in contact with bernstein and woodward before the book even came out because he knew it was gonna be something big right so this is like fresh on the heels this is like not even the social network closeness you know it's like this just happened yeah kind of thing so The cinematography carried this movie a lot. It's a great example of excellent cinematography Mm -hmm. that's not particularly flashy. It's just really good and really meaningful. It's extremely moody and the way they use camera angles and framing really does a lot. We kept taking notice of all the split focus shots Mm -hmm. because that, you know, it was funny. We were watching this with my dad. And we were commenting like, oh, it's it's interesting. They seem to be using a split focus lens here. And my dad thought we were complaining that like it bothered us for some reason that we no. that they were using a split focus lens. I'm like, no, we're trying that. we're trying to figure out why. We're trying to take notes and see like what the filmmakers are trying to convey to mm-hmm. us as the audience. And I, it, you know, the obvious direction is like something in the foreground versus something in the background. They want us paying attention to both. Yeah, they um, utilize that really interestingly. In a lot of ways. So like the end of the movie Particularly at the is end, yeah. you see the inauguration, you see them in the background typing away the, at, yeah, the, at like their big report. The left know? side of the screen is a TV with Richard Nick- Nixon's mm-hmm. inauguration. And then the right side is Woodward way in the background typing. And I am maybe embarrassed or maybe not embarrassed to say I was watching that TV for like a full minute before I even realized that Robert Redford was on the right side of the screen oh, yeah. typing the whole time. Yeah. there Another good utilization is when they first figure out about the money trail. They were trying to figure out like why this person's checks was in this person's name. And Robert Redford is trying to get the guy on the phone to like have him admit like what's going on or whatever. And in the background, You know, there's like the team looking at something on the TV. They're all talking super loud. All the newsroom scenes, the whole sound of this movie is like insane because it was very loud, but very purposely trying to convey like the craziness of a newsroom Mm -hmm. where it's like Robert Redford is trying to get this big scoop, but it's so loud and he's like trying to even hear them. And it's like he can't say like shut up because he doesn't want like the witness to like get off the phone and not tell him the information. And so he has to like tune in. So you feel very much like in his headspace space where like everything is loud around him and it's like but what's he gonna say what's he's gonna say like everyone shut up <laughs> yeah it's very cool we both loved that scene as soon as it was over i was like that was an amazing scene you were like yeah and mm-hmm. so the the key to that scene from a cinematography perspective was and i'm reading partially off my trivia here it was one single take that slowly tracked in to robert redford over the course of six minutes it was so worth it, though, because yeah. you felt exactly like you were in his headspace. Like, It was one of the best scenes in the movie. Yeah, because it was like, oh, no, he's like not going to admit to anything. Like everyone's being crazy evasive and they feel like they're going like nuts, like they're being like gaslit. Like, what even is this situation? Like they know something is off, but like no one is saying anything. And then finally he let something slip. And a lot of this movie is about them just having great journalism and just like letting a little bit slip for each of the informants yeah. and then piecing that together. Like them being like, OK, this initial is this person. So we're going to say That it's, we think it's this person and they'll just confirm it for us. Like they had such great interrogation techniques. You know, they really 
did sort of like the good cop, bad cop kind of thing. They would play off of that. Or like I don't know if it was good cop, bad cop. It was more like they did a really good job disarming each person did, that they exactly. talked to. Exactly. Like, so there's an instance um with Carl Bernstein. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> it's funny. So that's the scene that I stopped watching it the first time with Sloan's like financial Book, assistant. Bookkeeper? Yeah. Yeah. So She's like, I don't want to reveal anything. Like, I'm, I'm not saying anything. That's and he, where you stop. He slowly, I know it's pretty far into it, eh? Yeah. He slowly gets like a little bit here and there out of her, just like over the course of multiple hours. Yeah. And it's, it's just such good investigative journalism for sure. Yeah. Oh, and just to finish off that piece of trivia. So towards the end of that six minute take, Robert Redford accidentally calls the phone caller by the wrong name, but he stays in character. It appears genuine. So the take was used in the final cut. Yeah, it seems like they did that a lot. Like, there's a point where he's, like, trying to speak to someone in Spanish, but he doesn't get it. So he's like, anyone speak English? And he's like, Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then it's also said that it says the two lead actors memorized each other's lines so that they could interrupt each other in character. This unsettled a lot of the actors they were playing opposite, leading to a greater sense of authenticity. I think that worked. They it worked really well. They had a really great energy playing off of each other. Yeah. It was, it was interesting to see because it was like uh, Carl's character would like smoke all the time and, you know, Robert Redford's character was a little more clean cut. And it was just interesting to see like their dynamic play off of each mm -hmm. other, like all that energy. And stuff. Yeah. I mean, Robert Redford is a powerhouse, in my opinion. Su oh, such a great actor. <laughs> I would say underrated, but I'm sure at the time, like yeah. he was very much rated. He was like <laughs> yeah. a big star, but I feel like I don't know. I don't know. He's not as much in the zeitgeist now. Yeah. But. I want to, I really want to see more movies with him. And I want to see more movies yeah. with Dustin Hoffman because I didn't realize. I like, know. Got to see the graduate. How few movies I've seen with Dustin Hoffman, you know, like yeah. we got, we got Kramer versus Kramer. Excellent. We got Mr. Megorium's Wonder Emporium. That movie is like not bad. You know? And we got um, Hook. I haven't finished Hook either. We played Captain Hook. Um, Why, but, what's my problem with not finishing Dustin Hoffman in movies? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I watched like half of Hook, shut it off. I watched like half of Kramer versus Kramer originally, shut it off. Yeah. But yeah, this movie made me like, I, I don't know if it's just because they were made around the same time, but I was looking at Dustin Hoffman and I was thinking like, this is an extremely hot take, but I feel like. When it comes to like, and when I say extremely hot take, I mean like this take is white hot. Okay. I feel okay. like Al Pacino is like a poor man's Dustin Hoffman. You know, did you, did you read in the trivia that Al Pacino was originally cast? Yeah. 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 I, cause I can see a lot of similarities, not so much in like Al Pacino and Scarface or other roles where he's a little more gruff, but like sure. Al Pacino in like maybe The Godfather. In The Godfather, closer, Al Pacino for sure. in Dog like a Day Afternoon. More boyish. Dog yeah. Day Afternoon, like I could, I could see that. Be no, but totally. Al Pacino is great in Dog Day Afternoon. Oh yeah, and he's he's saying, good in The Godfather. Too. I just enjoy watching Dustin Hoffman a lot mm -hmm. more than Al Pacino. And Gabe, he has feel a little free more charm to come at me for that hot take because I know you're gonna. You think he likes Al Pacino more? I just think Gabe gets really riled up over my hot takes. I know, I know. Uh, Tom Peters would be like Al Pacino. Well, yeah. you know, he, <laughs> he's the goat. So, cinematography did a lot of heavy lifting. The acting was excellent. Oh, definitely. The script, I would say, was great. Like the the yeah. dialogue, I enjoyed the dialogue. The rat a tat tat, you know, mm -hmm. like and. I when I say I tried really hard to follow everything, I felt like I did follow everything. Okay. I I felt like I was able to to keep along from scene to scene, and like there wasn't really a point in the movie where I was like really confused what was happening. Like I I got it, I got kind of the connections mm -hmm. that were going on. Yeah, but but where I am screwing up is kind of like you know it's like when we interview people at work sometimes. Let's say we're interviewing about Rebel Without a Crew, the book next to you, you know, and you were Robert Rodriguez. I'd be like, so what was going through your mind when you came up with the idea for Rebel Without a Crew, mm -hmm. right? Or like, what was your writing process like? But one question that I might forget to ask, because in my mind is too obvious, is what is Rebel Without a Crew? 
Tell me about that book. What's it about? Okay. Like subconsciously, I might forget to ask that. So how that how I'm relating that to this movie is like I feel like I followed everything, except I m- somehow missed what exactly they did when they broke in. Were they bugging something? They were bugging. Were yeah. they shredding something? What were they bugging and why? I don't know okay. why, but I missed that part. This is my understanding of it. I'm not going to say that I have a full grasp over Watergate or American politics. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think the point of the cover up and everything that was going on was that it was intricate and layered so that they wouldn't get caught. So it's not like it's supposed to be easy to understand. They purposely made it confusing so people wouldn't look into it and that they wouldn't get caught. My understanding was that the robbers that I think were former CIA Mm -hmm. were bugging the National Democratic, Democratic, whatever, offices. And so when they revealed later on It was going back like a year that they were trying to sabotage the Democratic Party. And this is while they were doing like campaigning because the end of the movie is uh, Reagan's re-election. So I think the idea is that they were trying to cheat. Reagan's re-election? Nixon's re-election? Yeah. In my mind, they're very similar. (laughs) Yeah, Nixon... um, in my mind, it's like they're cheating. They're trying to sabotage the Democrats' chances of getting into office again. They're trying right. to rig the system, and it goes all the way to the top. Okay. Um, <laughs> and basically, like, it's, you know, like, that's that's cheating. You know, like, that's cheating to sabotage another politics. It's not fair. It's not, you know. Yeah. I mean, I understood that much. This is also another big blind spot for me is like I, I'm pretty vocal in that I don't really care about politics. It just doesn't interest me. And I know right. that's another like thing that's going to piss some people off. But like I understand the difference between conservative and liberal. Yep. Okay. I, I, I don't <laughs> know the difference between Democrat and Republican. I don't know which is which. Okay. Maybe it's just because I'm not American, but it's mostly because I don't care about politics. So even that I was I was finding hard to keep track of because I'm like, they're in the National Democratic headquarters. I'm like, okay, write that down. Check that off. But I didn't know if Richard Nixon was part of the Democratic Party or the um I don't even know what the other one is. What is Republican. it? Republican. Republican. Yes. He, um, he's the leader of the Republican Party. Yeah. See, that's key information. That's kind of important. But the thing. That's, a bl- that's my blind side. Yes. And I understand that. Blind spot. I understand that. But. The thing is, we have to take with a grain of salt is we're watching it in 2024. This movie came out in 76. You know, there's almost 50 years difference. But the audience seeing it. This is fresh. This is just happening. Right. Everyone knows about this scandal and what's it about. All the hearings were on TV. This the, was a big deal. This was the same problem that we had with The Passion of Joan of Arc. That Gabe, right. Gabe's, uh, you know, I was saying, I don't know actually what Joan of Arc did and why she was sentenced to death. And Gabe was saying at the time, everybody would have been talking about it. So it would have been redundant to re-explain it. Exactly. Well, someone like Joan of Arc, for instance, is like a folk hero. She's like very important Um, in the same way, you know, with Nixon. Nixon? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it was fresh because like the end of the movie is the inauguration. But over the course of those years, people, all the people involved finally fessed up to being a part of it, which you see at the preamble at the end on the typewriter. Speaking of which. Yeah. Did not like the ending. I didn't like that either. All. It felt like it was incredibly rushed, but that's kind of the thing with <sighs> real life movies is they have to figure out how to tie up their story at the end. They could have done a much better job. I know. There was so little payoff. I know. It it is it, uh, it, it like it pissed it's, me their off. Their lives were in danger at the end. Yeah. They're like we're in danger. Like this is bad and then they just like, yep. Like it's fine. Audience members out there, you know when you watch a movie, oftentimes at the theater, and it it ends, and you're just kind of left there looking at the screen, like, "Wow, really? That's how they're gonna end it? Are you serious?" Yeah. Okay. This is like the ultimate example of that for me, and I think the movie knew it because it did. It, yeah. It ends with um like a teletype machine typing out like 
what what ended up happening. And then it like cuts to black and it goes to the credits and there's no music in the credits for like a good 10, 15 seconds. Yeah. And it's like the movie is being like, yeah, that just happened. And it what did just happen. It did just happen. I know. Thing. But like, yeah, uh, to tell like the final part of the story just in text felt so. <sighs> I know because it felt like we were just getting to something. Well, the yeah. thing is is I can understand from a screenwriting perspective, it's like this movie is all about a huge scandal, political scandal involving the president. You know, the interesting part is the great journalism of them uncovering the scandal. And I would assume after that, it's just the fallout from them uncovering the scandal. But it's, it's interesting because the book covers the second half yeah but they just chose not to adapt it yeah it would have been a long movie but uh you know if lawrence of arabia is allowed to be that long that's the other thing is like the great escape was very well paced and it was almost three hours whereas this was two hours 20 ish and it felt longer than the great escape the pacing could have been better but there was a lot of moments i really enjoyed from this yeah to to a certain extent i i understand their level of pacing and and why they chose to do it this way because one thing that can help or hinder pacing is music and this movie had very little music Mm -hmm. and i know they were trying to probably trying to show like the realism of the situation i I think so yeah um and and some some points it worked in its favors like the absolute silence like it felt very high tension and you know they were burning the candle at both ends so Mm -hmm. when music is playing in a movie it often makes a scene feel like it's going by faster than it really is yeah but uh without music it really kind of slowed some of those moments down and showed how much time they were taking and sinking into this Mm -hmm. by the way i thought it was really interesting that they were they chose a location so mi- mundane as like a McDonald's for them to have like their late night like meetings together. Sure. And I just loved how the cinematographer framed that and, and shot that to make it look cooler and cinematic than it was. Because <laughs> you had had like sort of the warm tone, the 70s kind of fast food vibe in the front. And then the counter on the back was like super blue and it like everything was like dark and it was just like the windows with the pop of light like they definitely did some really interesting stylistic choices with like the mundane the simple yeah so like do you what did you think of this movie because i was left so conflicted there was a lot that i was like this is top tier this is excellent the filmmakers really know what they're doing Mm -hmm. but there was so much about it that made me feel empty where it shined was the amazing actors that conveyed like a really simple way of how the journalists would have talked to people and just simply disarmed them and just, you know, they figured things out by simply reading papers, calling people, uncovering it bit by bit. I think, you know, the natural charm of Dustin Hoffman, Robert Redford really helped with that. I think the the movie also shined in it's directing and cinematography making things look beautiful and everything i think it could have been better in its sound because i know sometimes it was like the the huge clacking of the typewriters and stuff was tr- trying to convey like a craziness but there were some times where it's like the sound is so bad and it doesn't feel like it should be intentional bad. like not bad just not what you would expect like there's a scene where dustin hoffman is like at a cafe talking to a woman outside and like a jet plane goes by. Oh yeah. <laughs> and she's like talking over the jet plane. <laughs> yeah, when that happened, yeah. I, I thought to myself, I was like, like my dad was like, do we want to turn on the subtitles? And I, I, I was like, no, I'm sure like, you know, they could have done a retake or they could have done ADR. So if that loud plane sound was in there, it was probably in there for a reason. And then once the scene ended, I was like, what was the reason? I think it was just realism. It's like that happened on the day, so we'll keep it in. But it's like at a certain point, it's like it's still a movie, you know? <laughs> I guess I can respect that. I don't know. So I'm very conflicted about sound. Like I understand the silent moments. I get that. It probably could have maybe used a little bit more music. 
personally. Like, I still think it was good. I think where it didn't shine as much was the script easily conveying to the audience what was going on. Information, yeah. Something like The Big Short, which is just as detailed and, like, boring in the minutia of uncovering the details of everything that's happening relating to the stock market and mortgages and stuff they did a lot better job of trying to convey to the audience what the mundane details actually mean and what it signified i think this was better than the big short i'm not saying it wasn't better than the big short i'm saying the big short made sure that it was clear to the audience what everything was detailing i know what you're saying i'm saying i think this is better than the big short and we're gonna watch i think we're gonna watch spotlight soon after this Um, And so we'll be able to compare another uh, journalistic focused movie. Right. Where I'm sure it's a lot of like talking to people, slowly uncovering. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Do you feel Do you think this was better than than uh, the big short? It's just different. It's it's it is very different. It's hard to compare. I don't know why we're comparing. It's a movie because it's political journalism, political shorts. Not wasn't very political, was it? it's did we finish the big short or did we stop halfway through no we finished it it deals with financial elements financial scandal okay and the thing with watergate is it starts with people getting caught bugging an office but that's just the tip of the iceberg of what happened afterwards yeah good opening by the way yeah very good good. and speaking of which here is one of the crazy, craziest pieces of trivia. Okay. Okay. You remember at the beginning of the movie when the security guard is walking around the building and he, do you know what I'm going to say already? I, I know about this detail. So just go ahead. Okay. Uh, the security guard is walking around the building and he takes a piece of, he finds a piece of tape on the door that left the door open. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. The security guard was played by the actual security guard that found the piece of tape. That's in amazing. In the real event. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Frank what, Frank Wills as himself. What I was going to say is the, the security guard might not have realized that anyone was there if they didn't close the door and take the piece of tape off. And it like one piece of tape basically instigated, like started a whole like breakdown of the government yeah it's just interesting how like it's like taking out a jenga piece it's like without the rest like it just crumbles yeah so Mm -hmm. here's the full piece of trivia frank wills as himself wills was the security guard at the watergate complex who discovered the masking tape on the door and notified the police just as he does in the movie he had been fired from his watergate job a few days after the break-in although no reason was given for this the one day he spent in 1975 playing himself in this movie was his first day's work since his dismissal from watergate oh my gosh that's insane boom Bim. Well, that's why no one wanted to talk about it because they didn't want to get in trouble for being involved in it because they could lose their jobs or they could potentially get killed. Mm. You know, I got one last piece of trivia here. This one's a little more out there. doesn't have to do as much with the real events, but get this. Screenwriter William Goldman was called to an impromptu meeting with Robert Redford, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, the real mm-hmm. Bob Woodward and the real Carl Bernstein. Yep. At the time, Goldman's draft of the screenplay had been accepted and they were waiting to hear from Woodward and Bernstein. At the meeting, they presented Goldman with a new screenplay written by Bernstein and then girlfriend Nora Ephron. Pretty cool. I mean, Nora certainly knows how to write a script. Goldman refused to read the screenplay and walked out of the meeting. Only one scene from that screenplay was in the final version of the film, the scene where Bernstein outsmarts a secretary to get in to see the Miami district attorney. The scene was pure fiction. It did not happen in real life. Woodward was allegedly unhappy with Bernstein's script as well because it depicted Woodward as a naive novice reporter who worshipped Bernstein's superior talent. Woodward later called Goldman to apologize, saying... I don't know what the worst six things I've ever done in my life are, but letting that happen, letting them write that is one of them. I don't think, at least in the final product, it's conveyed that Woodward Woodward doesn't know what he's doing. To me, he does know yeah. what he's doing. No, they threw out that that aspect of the script. Oh, okay, they, they didn't good. use Nora Ephron's script. Yeah, except for the except for the, the, the break, that that was but, yeah. that scene was good though. Um, yeah. 
I what I really liked as an establishing character moment early on was the scene where Carl took his uh draft of what happened and he's like I just need to punch it up like you don't mention like the scan like there's clarity like you don't m- mention the guy until paragraph three yeah and you know um like you Robert th- Redford is like I don't care that you did it I just didn't like the way you did it yeah but it, it was a good character moment because like you Definitely. think you think Dustin Hoffman is just being like well I'm better than you so I'm gonna redo it but then when he points out his reasons it's like no yeah that makes sense he's just being a dick about it I think that's why they work together so well is, you know, um, Bob was able to admit that his was better, but he's like, I just don't like the way you went about it. So like them, like finally reconciling with each other and like agreeing, like collaborating on this is what made it so good. Yeah. So overall, I would say. This is going to be a weird sentence, but I would say this is this was a great movie that I didn't enjoy that much. Because I mean, you didn't, didn't understand it. it. Um, y- yeah, they they did. I would say they did the absolute best they could have done with the subject matter. I think. Yeah, I think so. But too. even still, I I I just felt empty. I felt a bit empty, but like. What would the alternative have been to have someone explain to me what Watergate was about and then watch it? Because that's, then that's it's what like, they did okay, with the big short, yeah. why am I, you know? Right. Like, to me, I, I thought it was going to be most interesting if I went in cold. But apparently, I guess I needed prior yeah. knowledge. Well, or maybe they just, ex- maybe they didn't explain it properly and I missed it. But I swear, I was trying really hard. To stay focused and pay attention and follow everything. Right. I again, this all would have been in the news. It would have been fresh. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, I will say, um, they did finally reveal or like the person that was Deep Throat yeah. Kylie Fink finally came forward and uh he uh was the deputy of the FBI, so I can understand why he didn't want to talk. Mark Felt. Yeah. I believe was his name. Mm-hmm. Played by Liam Neeson. What? In a different movie. Sorry. <laughs> in a different movie made a few years ago. He was played by Liam Neeson. Oh, okay. Not in this movie. <laughs> I, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, in this movie he How? was. Yeah. In this movie he was played by. um Hal Holbrook. Yes. Yes. You got it. Yeah. Okay. Out of 10. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to give it a rating. No. Okay. Forget it. Simply on the charm of the lead actors alone, eight. Well, in the cinematography, I found it really great. Yeah. it's This movie has a lot to offer. I would recommend it. Especially if you're like a, a Robert Redford slash Dustin Hoffman fan. I a redhead? Say. Yeah. <laughs> or a Hoffhead? Yeah. A Hoffman. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a Hoffman. <laughs> Well, we should definitely watch The Graduate because The Graduate has great cinematography, great color grading, sure. great acting. Yeah, we can watch The Graduate. Yeah. But next time on the podcast, we're going to be watching yet another movie that I started and did not finish. Me this time, not Hannah. You haven't seen any of it, right? No, I'm, and, I'm probably not going to like it. Let's be honest. Is Apocalypse Now. I don't know if we'll have time to watch Heart of Darkness I would like to. I would like to as well, but I think they're both pretty long. So we'll see if we can fit them both in because I'm sure we would have a lot to talk about. Mm-hmm. But Just wait till you see the community episode that's a parody of Heart of Darkness. I've seen it. <laughs> it's one of one of the handful of community episodes okay. I have seen. All right. Which, by the way, we played the awesome popcorn chicken thing because we just watched a community episode where they're, uh, they take over the chicken tender market. Yeah, that one was good. Yeah. Community. Go watch yeah. it. It's funny. Yeah. Really uh, spitting the truth here. <laughs> no one watches that. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. We'll catch you in the next one. We watch Apocalypse Now, and I'll leave you with some more awesome some popcorn, popcorn chicken. chicken. Awesome popcorn chicken. Bam, 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 bam. Bye.